Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as the Spirit, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Man, that makes so much sense. I understand now why so many, even though we go by the title of Christian, don't understand the significance of the Old Testament or how the Old Testament applies to us today. Because it made it clear here. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says verse 14, but their minds are blinded for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. So just because we're calling ourselves Christian, unless we have completely submitted to Christ, unless we truly believe, unless we truly come in Christ, in Christ, like for real, for real, not just going to church, but really letting this work become our lifestyle, not just a Sunday thing, <laughs> not just for two hours on a Sunday, but an everyday 24-7, 365 thing, a, a lifestyle until this becomes a lifestyle. We won't even understand the Old Testament. It is veiled it or veiled, veiled, veiled it, veiled. It's veiled to those who are reading it. It says, but their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. That's why people can read the Old Testament and not get it. That's why it's not understood. Like when we say that we're not under law, we're under grace. It's not understood that you first see that that statement of not being under the law of sin, but being under grace. The very first time you see it written in the Bible or see it actually in action in the Bible is not in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. And it was first experienced by, well, it was experienced twice before an Israelite. It was, it was first experienced by Joseph, the son of Israel. And the second time it was experienced by a Gentile named Abimelech, who wasn't even an Israelite. He was a Philistine. Man. <laughs> like, like today people make the statement. They make these statements. They, they, there are scriptures and it sounds good. And so it sounds good. So I'm going to quote it. I'm not under law. I'm under grace. But you don't understand what it means. And you're not even quoting the scripture correctly. The entire scripture is found in Romans chapter 6 verse 14. And it says that sin no longer has dominion over me because I'm not under law. I'm under grace. And so then you see that first being or happening. And, and like we, we attribute this to happening after Jesus Christ came but what we don't understand is that covenant was really first made with Abraham and Israel broke it like like Abraham's grandchildren they were supposed to 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 
be representatives of the kingdom of God on earth as kings and priests. And they were supposed to represent God to the rest of the nations who was bound under the law of sin, under all this demonic stuff that was going on because of what these demonic angels had did, or they were once angels, but they now demons. They had come down and forsake their normal place to mate with women. And of course, they couldn't go back to heaven after doing that, like with the flood. And, and so all this stuff that they had did in the nations was was bound to this stuff and so they were worshiping these things and 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 Israel when God chose Israel when God made his his covenant that was originally that that originally Adam had broke like when you see it like you, again it says therefore since we have such a hope we use great boldness of speech unlike Moses see Moses couldn't tell Moses <laughs> Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face, and the reason he had to veil his face is because after spending 40 days that second time in, in the mountains with God, and God poured all this stuff in him, he began to glow because he was reflecting who he had been with. He was Moses was reflecting the presence of who he had been with. And so when he came back, he was glowing. But here's the thing. That's what King Jesus is doing with us. That's why in Malachi, Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, we're told that Jesus was sent like a refiner's fire and like a launder soap <laughs> and that he is going to purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. The end result, which, you know, reading the Old Testament, you, you many who has the veil can't see this. The end result is that we will reflect King Jesus. We will mirror him. That's why we're told to not walk in the flesh, but to walk in the spirit. That's why. Like, like, man, I get this scripture. I get it. I get it. Ah, I get it. I get it. So it says that, and, and then it talks about how they couldn't look steady at the end of what was passing away. And what was passing away was the ministry of death, which is what the law was, was called. The, the, that old covenant was called. It was a ministry of death. But who put us under that ministry of death? Listen, who put us under that ministry of death was not Moses at, the, at Mount Sinai. Uh-uh. Who put us under the ministry of death was Adam in the garden when he made the mistake that he made. When he chose to not be obedient to God and to the one law that God gave, which was to not covet, basically, to not eat of the one of the two trees that was in the garden, but the one, the knowledge of good and evil, to not eat of that. And so God had to, well, well first of all, God's grace is first seen in the garden too when when he cursed the serpent he said that the seed of the woman was going to crush the serpent in the head. God had made provisions for us. Then he covered Adam and Eve with skin and put them outside of the garden and blocked the way to the tree of life so that Adam and Eve would not be stuck in that condition and neither would we. Like all of that was grace. The fact that he didn't destroy all of them right then was grace. We're here today because of because of God's grace. We're here today. And then, like, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. That ministry of death, see, see, the wages of sin is death. So Adam <laughs> dumped us into this. We have inherited sin in us. That's the ministry of sin. And the purpose of the law which God's word say is holy, which God's word say is glorious, which God's word say is perfect. The, pur the purpose of the law was never to make any of us holy. The purpose of the law was never to make any of us perfect or holy. The purpose of the law <laughs> was so that we can understand the sin. We can understand it revealed, it exposed 
the sin. That's what the law did. Therefore, it was perfect. It did what it was supposed to do. Expose law. I mean, expose sin to us so that we can come out from under that, come under grace, and then say to sin, no, mm -mm, which is what Joseph did. Joseph, the son of Jacob, who was named Israel. So Joseph was one of those Israel. He, he was the son of Jacob. Joseph was presented. Joseph, first of all, Joseph had God's favor. He had God's mercy. He had God's grace with everything that was done to him. He's being raised now in a foreign land, stripped away from his family. But God was with him every step of the way. And he ended up being bought by Potiphar, who was some type of big wig for the Egyptians. And, and Potiphar took him in. And then Potiphar saw that Joseph had God's favor on him. So Potiphar put Joseph in charge of everything. The scripture says about Potiphar that he had no idea what was in his house except for the bread that he was eating. That's how blessed Joseph was. Joseph who was in charge of everything in Potiphar's house. That's how blessed Joseph was. He put Joseph in charge of everything. Now remember Moses was not even born yet. Joseph's big brother was named Levi. Moses was not born yet. The Israelites had not even entered in slavery yet. Therefore, the most what, what we call the Mosaic Law Covenant had not even the, the laws that God gave to Moses, those laws that had a job of exposing sin and identifying to the people what sin is, it had not even come into existence. And yet Joseph in charge of all of this stuff and flourishing for his boss, both in the house and in the field, his wife, the boss's wife now comes to Joseph and she's like, come sleep with me. And Joseph says, you know, he say, my boss, your husband, has put me in charge of everything. There is nobody more important in this house than me. I, I'm, I'm running all of this. He says to her, he says, how can I commit this wickedness? He called it wickedness, and yet there was not a law to say that that was wickedness. Do you understand? Joseph was not under law. Period. It wasn't a law to call it. He said, how can I commit this great wickedness? And then he says something else. And sin against God. And yet there was nothing written. That is the first real picture that we get to see of being under grace. Joseph was under grace in Egypt and God was favoring him. We like to walk around talking about favor ain't fair. Yeah, it ain't fair. <laughs> favor ain't fair. Like, you know, look at what God is doing. God blessed Joseph and he had the knowledge to see that when someone presented this woman, who I almost called her something, <laughs> when this woman presented something to Joseph, that was incorrect he was able because of his relationship with God because of how close he was with God he was able to say mm, no that's not right and that's what the law does so Joseph had something that his brothers didn't have are you hearing me Joseph had something that his brothers didn't have Joseph had something that was so real, that was so pure. And he was able to say to her, he was like, mm -mm, that's wicked. Nope, that's wicked. I'm not about to do that. I'm not about to sin against God and lose favor with God. Uh -uh, no, <laughs> like he was serious. But here's somebody else. Let's look at this Gentile now. Before Joseph was even born, before Joseph's granddaddy, Isaac, was even born, um, Abraham, it had, uh, Abraham and his wife, they, their brother and sister, but their wife, they had the same daddy but different mamas, basically. Um, and we don't find that out until this story with what happened with this Gentile. So 
uh, this was directly after Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. And Abraham was like, y'all, come on, we about to move. <laughs> I don't even want to look at that. We about to move. And they did. They, they moved further south so that they didn't have to look out their backyard and see that destruction and, and see all of that. So they moved. And they moved to this area called Gerar. Gerar. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Gerar. 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 Maybe Gerar. And, and, um... It was a Philistine area, and it was ran by this this guy, this king named Abimelech, you know. And so Abimelech saw Sarah, and Abraham was like, that's my sister. And Sarah was like, that's my brother. So Abimelech saw her, and he like, give me that. <laughs> he took her. And so God comes to Abimelech, a Philistine. God comes to a Philistine. God speaks to a Philistine in his sleep. And he says to this Philistine, he says, you a dead man. He said, because of this woman you took, you a dead man. He said that she's the wife of another. And, 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 and Abimelech, now remember, he sleep. And Abimelech in his sleep, like, I don't know if y'all dream. I have dreams, right? And, and I have these vivid dreams. And I be waking up like, oh, and this happened. And it is. <laughs> my husband be tripping out on me. I'm a dreamer. So Abimelech, hold on one second. Okay. Sorry about that. So Abimelech, Abimelech, in his dream, he's talking to God. And God tells him, you're a dead man. And he tells him, why? And so Abimelech is like, but he's like, first of all, he told me that, that that was his sister. And she said that was his brother. And I, I didn't know. And at the integrity of my heart, are you going to kill a righteous nation? A righteous. How can you be righteous if there's no law? How how can you be declared righteous if there is no law? Anyway, he says he says, um, are you gonna destroy a righteous nation? Like I didn't know. And God says to him, Yeah. He says, Yeah, I know you didn't know. I know they said what they said, and I know that you didn't know, and I know that you acted out of integrity, and then God said something, and I was like, Oh, there go grace. I was like, there go grace. Oh, this is what God said to him. He said, I did not let you touch her. I did not let you touch her. Check this out. Grace is not a get out of jail free card. Grace is not one of those things where, okay, I could go and mess up and then I just apologize and I just repent later. God's grace helps us to obey God's law. Do you understand? God's grace, his favor upon us, helps us. We have, we, when we have God's grace... We have more of a desire to not disobey God than we have to get caught up in sin. We don't want to upset. We, it's the fear of the Lord in our hearts. We don't want to upset God. We don't want to lose favor with God. We don't want. We so we say to, to, to we say to sin. Mm -mm, there is nothing that you got that I want. No, like mm -mm, no, I'm good. Bye. <laughs> Like Joseph said, no. He, he was like, no. And when that lady tried to, to really get him, and she made sure that all the other people was out the house, all the other men was out the house, and Joseph ain't thinking, and he's still in the house, and she go grab him, and he came right up out his clothes. He's like, no. You have there today, you have people like you tell them no for something, and they keep asking, and they keep asking, and you have to steady say no. I had to tell this person they called about my house, my husband and I house, and they called me about selling. I said, look, we are not looking for, to sell this house. 
um, don't even quote me anything. We, we're not looking. We're not interested. Don't call me no more. As a matter of fact, take my number off your list. She said, well, if you, um, if you heard a quote, I said, listen, I said, no. I don't want to hear no quote. I'm not interested. I was trying to be nice. Now I'm I'm telling you, take my name off your list. Don't call me no more. And now I'm about to go hang up. I, I and I hung up. I was like, bye. <laughs> you know, just, I just hung up. Like there's no conversation. And that was the thing that happened with with Eve. Eve should not have had a conversation really with that serpent at all. She should not have had a conversation. And I think. Two, as I look at the conversation, I think a part of it is that she really didn't expect that it was going to turn out. I kind of think they were talking to all the animals. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I think all the animals could talk. I don't know. I don't know. You know, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, I don't think that she expected it to turn out the way she did. You know, because when he asked her what he did, it didn't seem imposing. It didn't seem threatening. And where she got tripped up, like the more I look at it, where she got tripped up was she misquoted. She misquoted. God said, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, don't eat from that tree. And she said, the tree that's in the midst of the garden, we're not to eat from. And that's how she misquoted because it was two trees in the midst of the garden. So when Satan says to her, like you need to go look at it. When Satan says to her, um, you definitely will not die if you eat from the tree, um, from that tree. He was talking about, first he was talking about the tree of life. Because we're told in the same, in chapter 2, before we're even told about the law to not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, we're told that the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden. So by her not identifying which tree, by her not saying it exactly as it was said to her, it got twisted. And that has been my big issue with this thing about the fact that we say I'm not under law, I'm under grace. I have been like really before the Lord with this and like he's showing me so much and I'm like how is this not being understood like and, and I'm asking people when they when I hear people say it I'm like okay what law are you not under like for real what law are you not under and then the scripture itself says the law of sin and so we'll say the mosaic law but I'm like wait wait something something is just not sitting right here something's not sitting right here something and i'm looking at this and i'm looking at this and i'm looking at this and then they'll say stuff like you know because because the first thing they'll say is well we don't have to slaughter animals anymore and sacrifice animals i'm like well yeah duh because jesus did that that but that was all symbolic and and what i find is the more people try to explain and try to explain the mosaic law and the only thing they, they can say is we don't sacrifice animals. What is being missed is this. We don't have to sacrifice animals. Because Jesus was that sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God. But we following in Jesus' footsteps. Listen. Following in Jesus' footsteps. Which is what it means to come under grace and to be in Christ. We have now died to ourselves. So now we are alive in Christ, which means that we're walking in his footsteps, right? And so walking in his footsteps, Jesus sacrificed himself. And we today don't understand like when y'all go to y'all church services and the worship be really good and y'all be in there and y'all be singing and y'all be worshiping and your eyes be closed and your hands be lifted and you just be praising and worshiping and the tears be falling. You don't understand that you're giving a burnt offering at that moment. The burnt offering, the sacrifice of the lamb following in Jesus footsteps you're giving your all to God I surrender all to you everything I give to you withholding nothing 
but I get it now. I get it now why this is not understood. I get it now. I get it now why people don't understand how to apply what happened before what they were going through before all they can say is we don't got to do that yeah but you don't understand God said that we walk not in the flesh we walk in the spirit so there are spiritual principles tied to everything in the Old Testament there was a purpose everything in the Old Testament was a copy of what was already being done in heaven and it's still being done in heaven it was just a shadow a copy of the real it was temporary but but in this temporary, we can look at the temporary and understand so that we can do, listen. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech, unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded for until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on the heart. That veil that is on the heart. That's why God's word tells us to circumcise our hearts. That's what we need to be circumcised. The heart needs to be cut. The heart needs to be rendered so that we can begin to truly understand. There were things that when Jesus was on earth, he wanted to share with his disciples, but he couldn't. They didn't understand it. Just like the instance in John chapter 9. When the disciples asked Jesus about that um, young man who was born blind. And he said to Jesus, who sinned, the man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither. They didn't understand what was happening. They did not understand that that man represented all of us. That man represented all of us. Because right behind that, Jesus in chapter 10 starts talking about how a sheep would know the voice of the shepherd. You can't see with your ear. We would know the voice. Or how we're told that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. We would know the voice and how the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Like all these things that just, or the woman that was caught in the act of adultery. She was caught in the act of adultery. We know that adultery is when you have sex with somebody you're not married to, but she was caught in the act. So there was an action. She was literally acting it out. And they brought her. But where was the man she was having adultery with? We don't understand how that applies today. Because we're so busy looking at the story itself. Not realizing that Jesus is talking about how adulterous we have been. And that we call ourselves being Christian. We call ourselves worshiping and serving him and yet we're doing all this other stuff. But the minds was blinded until this day. The same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on the heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, when you for real, for real, turn to the Lord and away from people. Look in Jeremiah chapter 2. God says about the people that they've committed two sins. Number one, they left him the fountain of living water. And then number two, they hewn out for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot haunt. Um, whole water so in other words and again that's old testament so many won't understand that but in other words what he's saying is that here's his word he wants to talk to us directly 
He wants to talk to us, but we don't have the time to open it and read it. We won't sit with God's word and read it and reflect on it and meditate it on, think about what it means. Instead, we'll take two hours on one day a week. I'm not going to say which day. We'll take two hours on one day a week and we'll go sit and let somebody take one verse and talk to us all about it and crack a few jokes. And then, you know, and then we thought we'd done something. And God says... You ain't spending time with me. You ain't doing that for me. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, we are told to offer ourselves a living sacrifice to God. That's what Jesus did. That's the whole burnt offering. We're told to renew our minds, to, to not think like this world, to walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. He's steady calling to us, steady calling to us. It says, but we all with unveiled face, behold, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. We're being transformed into the image of Christ so that we will mirror him. Not us doing, listen, when Jesus was here on earth, he did the will of the father. He said several times, I didn't come to do my own will. I do the will of him who sent me. That's what Jesus said. And that's what we're supposed to be doing when we're under grace, dead to the, to the world, dead to the flesh. That ministry of death has now passed because we're now alive in Christ, walking and living and breathing in Christ. It is about Christ Jesus and we do the way we lay our will down like he did. He said, Father, not as I will, but as you will. We lay our own will down, the free will that was given to us. We lay it down and we pick up and do the will of the Father. Jesus did not do away with the law. He fulfilled the law. And then he gave us something. Because see, in the law, I think it's chapter 20 or chapter 21. It was like a tit for tat thing. In the law, it was tit for tat. So you and your emotions, you're a Christian, you believe in Christ, but you get in your emotions and you quick to be ready to go tit for tat with somebody. Oh, really? That's, that's how it's going to be? Oh, that, that, that's the Mosaic law. You cannot claim that you are not under law. You're under grace and you're going tit for tat with somebody. You cannot claim that you are not under law. You are under grace when you are getting in your emotions, slandering somebody, arguing with somebody, trying to fight somebody, um, committing fornication, committing adultery or any other of the lusts of this world. Um, any type of moral depravity, whatever it is that God's word, listen, God's word went into detail for us. He went into details for us. In Galatians chapter 6, I think it is, he went into details about the works of the flesh. All of that is under law. But then he tells us the works of the spirit and what the works of the spirit, the fruits of the spirit are. are. And he says that the law has no, that, let me go, let me go. Because none of that is under the law. None of that. But let me say it how it says it here in the scripture. <laughs> Galatians chapter 5 is verse number 22. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such there is no law. Well, how about this? These fruits of the Spirit is the very characters of God. Compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, merciful, forgiving. And do you know how Moses responded to that? When Moses heard that, he hurried up and bowed down. And he said, Lord, if I find favor in your sight, Lord, please hear my heart's cry. 
you don't think I you don't think he said that? Look, let me read it. It says then it says so Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worship. Then he said, If now I have found grace in your sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray, go among us, even though we are stiff necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin and take us as your inheritance. Moses was begging for the people, begging for the people. Please forgive us. And God did. God did. Grace. So anyway, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it thanks to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that um, this is veiled. The Old Testament is veiled. Man, you don't know what you're missing. <laughs> to those who are not in Christ. But once you come in Christ, for real, for real, not just bearing the title of calling yourself Christian, but what you, once you for real, because it says, nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So therefore, if the Old Testament is not being understood, that means it's veiled. And that means that you need to turn to the Lord. The scripture said it. Oh, it's not me saying it. I read it. Verse number 16. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. It says verse chapter 4, verse 1, 2 Corinthians. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, but even if our gospel is veiled, even if what I'm saying to you, you still don't understand it. The scripture says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, the reflection, which is why Jesus, some of the trials that some people are going through, and they'd be like, oh, the devil is bit No. <laughs> Cause, 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 Christ defeated the devil a long time ago. <laughs> the scripture says he is purifying us because he's getting us ready so that we will be spot free when he returns. So there's stuff deep down embedded deep down in us that has to be purged out, that has to be brought out, and so we'll go through some things so that this stuff can be removed. It says. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is awesome. This is awesome. Keep reading. Hi. Thank you for watching.